All righty, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for tuning on in. Today we're going to be discussing what if Interstate 40 were high-speed rail instead. We're going to aim to answer three questions. First one, where would the route go? Second one, how long would it take to travel from city to city compared to driving in a car? And then the third one, how much would this whole thing cost? And throughout this video, we're going to be examining three scenarios. First scenario is what is the current state of the art? So, you know, how long does it take to drive in a car currently? What would it take to rebuild the roads currently? That kind of thing. Second scenario is higher speed rail. So, rail that goes 125 miles an hour. And we'll use the statistics from Brightline Florida to give us a good estimate on both timing and cost. And then the third scenario would be true high speed rail. We'll assume that it goes 200 miles an hour. And for our cost estimate, we'll use California high speed rail as it currently stands in the Central Valley as far as cost estimates and that kind of thing. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to discuss is the route. I-40 as it currently stands starts in the west in Barstow, California and goes all the way to Wilmington, North Carolina. Well, that's good for a road because it tees into Interstate 15 in California and goes nearly to the East Coast in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, that's not the most effective route if you were to put high speed or higher speed rail. The route that we're going to use in this video will start in Las Vegas, Nevada, go to Kingman, Arizona, then follow I-40 all the way to Oklahoma City, where we'll take a little detour and go up towards Tulsa in order to serve more people, and then follow I-40 all the way until you get to Asheville. In Asheville, we'll assume the route goes direct to Charlotte. So why not go to Winston-Salem, Raleigh, and all that? Charlotte is the most populous city in North Carolina, and plus, there already exists rail between Raleigh, Durham, and Winston-Salem. So I think it would make the most sense to go to the most populous city and call that the terminus on the east side. So I think we've established a pretty good route. Now let's talk about how the travel times would compare to flying or driving. To do this comparison, we need to make a few assumptions. So, to calculate our travel time with driving, we're going to assume that you average 70 miles an hour and you don't stop at all. I think that's pretty generous considering that you're going to need to stop for gas every 400 miles, plus you'll need to stop to get food and go to the bathroom. Nonetheless, we'll be generous and assume that you average 70 miles an hour if you drive. To calculate our higher speed rail calculation, we're going to assume that you travel 120 miles per hour. This is consistent with the speeds that Brightline travels between West Palm Beach and Orlando. We're also going to assume that each stop takes 10 minutes, 5 minutes to load and unload, and then also it takes an extra 5 minutes to accelerate and decelerate. Finally, for our high speed rail comparison, we're going to assume that you're going to be traveling 200 miles an hour. This is consistent with most high speed rail systems throughout Europe, and it's consistent with the high speed rail goals of California high speed rail. With the high speed rail calculations, we're also going to assume that every stop adds 10 minutes an extra five minutes for acceleration and deceleration, and five minutes to load and unload. That may not be enough time, or it may be too much time, but 10 minutes is what we're going with because it's a nice even number. With those assumptions, if you were to drive the entire route end to end, it would take 32 hours and 40 minutes. That is a ton of time. But if you went with the higher speed rail option that goes 120 miles an hour, it would take just over 22 hours to go from end to end. Finally, if you were to go with the high speed rail option, it would take 14 and a half hours to go from Charlotte to Vegas or vice versa, including stops. Now those numbers aren't terribly impressive considering that you could fly, but where this idea really starts to shine is when you look at cities that are under 400 miles apart. As an example, if you wanted to go from Memphis to Knoxville to watch UT lose a game, you could drive and that would take you five and a half hours each way. You could fly and the total flight time is three and a half hours from when you enter the airplane to when you get off the airplane, assuming that there's a layover in Atlanta. But the thing about flying is you'd have to budget extra time to get through security and to get to the airport from downtown. But if you went with a 120 mile an hour rail option, it would take you from downtown Memphis to downtown Knoxville in right around four hours. Plus, you wouldn't have to worry about the hassle of getting crammed onto a plane and going through security and worrying about a layover in Atlanta and possibly missing your flight or having it delayed or having it canceled. And on top of that, you don't have to worry about getting gouged by airline. Tickets range from $230 if you catch a red eye early in the morning, all the way to $400 plus, depending on the time of day that you book. If the rail ran 200 miles an hour, you could get to Knoxville in two and a half hours and have plenty of time to come home after you watch UT get beat. As another example, if you wanted to travel from Little Rock to Nashville, that would take you five hours in a car, and about that long if you wanted to travel via plane. But if the 120 mile an hour rail were built, 
it would take you under three and a half hours. You could eat breakfast in Little Rock and be in Nashville before lunch and not have to worry about traffic. And to give a somewhat selfish example, if you were like me and lived in Albuquerque but you got family back in Tennessee and the 200 mile an hour rail existed, you could hop on a train here in Albuquerque at 6 in the morning and 8 hours later in Nashville at 3 o'clock central time, you'd be getting off the train in Nashville for a total travel time of 8 hours plus the 1 hour because of the time change. The thing that you have to remember is, if you travel by rail, you're not at the mercy of weather like you are if you travel by plane. When I go back home to Tennessee, there's been several times where I've been stuck in Dallas because American Airlines doesn't have their stuff together or because the weather's bad. If the high-speed rail existed, I wouldn't have to worry about that. And yeah, I know it's a little bit selfish, but I think a lot of people would travel more if this were an affordable option, both from a time and money perspective. There are tons of possibilities for all the connections and the shortened travel time if this were to be built. I don't want to waste too much time talking about it in the video. I'll leave a link to the Google Sheets that I've created so that y'all can mess around with exactly how much time it would take compared to driving. So the next question I want to answer is how much would something like this cost? In order to answer that question, we need to take a look at other systems and how much they cost. For starters, we'll take a look at the Brightline extension from West Palm Beach all the way to Orlando. The cost of that extension was $1.75 billion, and the length of the route was 170 miles. When you divide out the numbers, it comes in around $10.5 million per mile. However, I don't think that's a terribly fair number considering that part of the Brightline system had already been built. When you factor in the stations that had already been built all the way to Miami, the cost of the system is $4.2 billion over the course of 237 miles. When you divide those numbers out, it comes into roughly $18 million per mile which I think is a little bit more fair of a number to use. So we know how much the 120 mile an hour higher speed rail costs, but what about the 200 mile an hour high speed rail cost? For this estimate, we'll use the numbers from California High Speed Rail. When complete, the system will be 520 miles long. The cost estimate of building out the system ranges from $88.5 billion on the low end all the way to $128 billion on the high end, just depending on how quickly they can get the money and how much everything will cost by the time they finally get things done. So on the low end, the cost per mile of the California High Speed Rail is right around $170 million per mile. On the high end, it comes out to almost $250 million per mile. One thing to note here as well is that the Brightline system is expected to be up and running sometime this year. And while yes, it's taken six months longer than they expected, they're still going to get this thing done. Unfortunately, California High Speed Rail doesn't have tracks up and running yet. Now, we'll take a look at the estimate of how much it would take to build that entire route, but with a four-lane highway. To do the estimate, we'll take a look at the numbers from the status of the nation's highways, bridges, and transit conditions report, specifically the 24th edition. Looking at the report, we'll assume that we're building four lanes in a rural area. I know that some of the route goes through more urban areas, but to keep the calculation simple, we'll call everything rural. You'll notice that the cost per lane mile varies from $5.2 million per lane mile if you're on a flat area, all the way to $11.1 .1 million per lane mile if you're in a mountainous area. I took the liberty of classifying each section as either flat, rolling, or mountainous. Really the only mountainous terrain is between Knoxville and Asheville, but you can check out the Google Sheets document if you want the exact details. Then for each segment, we have to multiply by four because we're doing four lanes, two in each direction. On top of that, we're going to also have to multiply by 1.2445 to adjust for inflation. When we multiply everything out and sum everything up, the total cost of that 2200 mile route comes out to roughly $79.6 billion, which comes out to $35 million per mile. So that tells us if we were going to build a four lane interstate the entire length of this proposed route, it would actually be twice as expensive as building a Brightline style train. So let's compare the final numbers for the cost calculation for building the entire route. If we were to build the entire length of the route, as a four-lane highway, the total cost would be $79.6 billion. If we were to build the entire length of the route as a 120 mile an hour higher speed rail, the total cost would be $38.8 billion. And if we were to build the whole system as a 200 mile an hour high speed rail, the cost would be somewhere between 388 to 571 billion dollars. That's a ton of money. So what are my thoughts on this now that we've run the numbers? Well, first of all, everything is expensive nowadays, but I do want to point out that the reason why the United States experienced such an economic boom in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s was the fact that there was massive investment in infrastructure. In the case back then, they invested in interstate highways. 
Now with denser populations, it would make more sense to invest in higher speed and high speed rail. If you go the higher speed option instead of the true high speed option, it's actually half the cost per mile of building a four lane highway. Before we wrap things up, I do want to talk about where this analysis falls short a little bit. I did not include cost estimates per mile of the Texas Central high speed rail or for Brightline West high speed rail. Brightline West high speed rail is purported to cost $10 billion over a 218 mile segment. That comes into under $50 billion per mile and it's true high speed rail. But to simplify calculations, we left that out. Additionally, my cost estimate for building a four lane highway isn't truly accurate because in cities, the cost per mile of constructing highways is actually higher and you're probably going to be building more than four lanes. If y'all made it this far, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, give it a like. If you didn't like it, let me know in the comments what I could have done better. Or if you want to start a discussion, start it in the comments. There's always a lot of good discussion on these videos. In the end, we as Americans have a choice. We can continue to build roads wider and wider and wider and just continue to sit in traffic and waste all of our hard-earned money on gasoline and car repairs. Or we can put tax dollars to better use by building high speed and higher speed rail in between cities. Thanks again for watching. We'll catch you in the next video.